what's happening, guys? I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. So it's pretty clear at this point that the age of the privacy has gone the way of the dodo bird. But at least there's one area where people still feel secure, with their doctors. Well, now you can kiss that notion goodbye as well. See, a new report from Bloomberg Business Week outlines a questionable new practice being employed by Carolina's healthcare system, a healthcare provider that operates over 900 medical centers across North and South Carolina. Turns out the hospital chain is actually mining the credit card information of 2 million patients in order to predict when they will get sick. And get this, the provider is even using patient purchase information to have doctors preemptively intervene in their lives. Now, Carolina's Healthcare is defending the practice by saying this type of data collection allows doctors to get a fuller picture of their patients, thereby decreasing readmittance rates. But conspicuously, the company won't disclose the provider of the data. Now, thankfully, the Affordable Care Act outlaws the use of personal data to lower or raise insurance rates, but that isn't stopping other healthcare providers from using big data to bolster their bottom lines. Take the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, for example. The healthcare providers information division, I'm sorry, insurance division, is using demographic data to zero in on those who make less than $50,000 a year because poorer people tend to go to the emergency room more. Listen, I'm all for preventative health care, but invading every aspect of people's private lives sure as hell ain't the way to go about it. As Assistant Director of Healthcare Ethics at Santa Clara University puts it, if the physician already has the information, the relationship changes from an exchange of information to a potential inquisition about behavior. Indeed, with a for-profit healthcare system firmly in place, the last thing we need are insurance predators itching to exploit one of the last bastions of privacy we have. Now let's break the set. State, and we're working very hard to make it up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, wait, do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Under the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, it's the right of every U.S. citizen to file requests. And every year, the U.S. government receives thousands of inquiries for the declassification of documents. Now, even though Obama declared that his administration would be the most transparent in history, according to a study by the Associated Press, the administration's denial of requests has actually gotten worse over Obama's presidency. In fact, last year saw a 22 percent increase in national security exemptions from the previous year. Now, many of these requests are for relatively recent documents. But what about documents dating back decades? Under the statute of limitations for declassification, every year millions of documents are automatically released to the public when they reach 25 years old, unless an agency seeks an exemption for secrecy. The 25-year rule has helped historians clarify moments in American history ranging from the Vietnam War to the Cuban Missile Crisis. But even with over a billion pages released by the government to date, Many of these historic records are still shrouded from public view. Now, theoretically, any American citizen can file a FOIA request to access this information, including government officials, which is exactly what one former CIA agent did. His name's Jeffrey Scudder, former CIA officer with the agency's Historical Collections Division. And his job was to convert documents into searchable digital files. Back in 2007, he stumbled upon thousands of articles that were listed as public but were not actually searchable within the National Archives that related to World War II and Cold War era intelligence and espionage. Now, doing only his job, Scudder attempted to have the documents released by the CIA, only to be blocked by the Oversight Review Board. So he did what any American has the legal right to do. He filed a FOIA. Except when he did, he set off a chain of events that would completely ruin his career. According to Greg Miller of the Washington Post, Scudder was confronted by supervisors and accused of mishandling classified information while assembling his FOIA. His house then raided by the FBI, his family's computers seized. Yes, his home was raided for simply filing a FOIA. 
And even though the investigation didn't lead to a single criminal charge, Scudder had his job and security clearance stripped. He was forced to retire to not lose his pension. Now, what happened to Scudder is becoming an increasingly familiar story, given the government's ramped up war on whistleblowers. But really, here's the takeaway. This is what happens when you try to call out abuse within the proper channels of government. So the next time you hear people criticizing Edward Snowden for not working within the system, tell them to take heed of Scudder's tale. Because rather than being rewarded for trying to improve the system, you'll be crushed by it instead. changed the world and profoundly impacted the human experience. And now that we're all well into the age of online communication, threats to the future of a free and open internet abound. Take for example the ruling by a European court earlier this year granting a so-called right to be forgotten. Within days of the ruling, Google has already scrubbed countless links from search results, among them a BBC article about the ousting of a former Merrill Lynch CEO, Stan O'Neill, 2007, a critical piece of reporting preceding the global financial meltdown. Google removing this article from its engine has sparked criticism that the right to be forgotten is actually an open invitation to rewrite history and censor the internet on behalf of the powerful. I mean, now to talk a little bit more about the larger implications of this ruling and the biggest threats facing a free and open internet internet user, BTS producer, Manuel Rapolo. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> What's up, man? So let's start really quickly talking about this ruling. What wider precedent do you think this sets? I think, like you said, I mean, it encourages this sort of whitewashing of history, this sort of rewriting of history. It encourages censorship. And even though that this Merrill Lynch story, uh, this article that was kind of scrubbed by a Google, you can't search it on Google, you can still search it on other websites. What we need to look at is the fact that this isn't an isolated incident. Like you mentioned, in the days following that ruling, there were thousands of requests to have uh, articles, individual profiles, uh, kind of scrubbed and not being searchable. So this is, this is something that, that a lot of people are wanting, a lot of individuals are, are seeking to do, and this ruling is kind of a result of that. So there are negative implications, like you said right now, but moving down the road, the longer this goes, we're going to, I think, continue to see even more uh, negative implications of it. Yeah. Right, and unfortunately, you know, everyone who has, is remotely in the public view has her horrible things written about them online. I can attest to that. Uh, but the thing is, only the rich and powerful can really take the initiative to scrub their history and rewrite it. So, you know, I'm, I don't have the means to really scrub all, all the negative things written about me online. So it's just, uh, once again, kind of that two-tiered um, justice system, essentially, in this, in this ruling. Pew Research Center has recently identified four kind of standing threats to a free and open internet. I wanted to go over the first one, which is just nation states clamping down um, on an open internet, Manny. Right. No, this is this is uh, pretty comprehensive. They did a study of 1,400 different experts and kind of what they saw as being the biggest threats, like you said, the nation state control. And when we think about that, I think the first thing that comes to mind is kind of uh, the attack on free speech that this has. And good examples of that would be like Egypt, Pakistan, Syria, uh, Turkey. countries, Turkey, exactly, where one day you have an internet, kind of a mobilization of an uprising, the next day the internet's suddenly gone. Um, and this, this is happening, this isn't isolated just in in the Middle East, it's happening everywhere, uh, where, where countries, uh, governments are taking kind of the reins of, you know, what's okay on the internet, what you can see, what you can't see. We've heard of the Great Firewall of China. We know that uh, bloggers are having to register with the, with the Russian government. Uh, and another kind of big study that, that I was looking into was one by the Open Net Initiative, where 25 countries, they looked at a ton of countries, and 25 countries have almost total control of what you can see and, and can't see on the internet. It's and disturbing. another report of the UK, where one in five websites um, are filtered where you uh whether it be pornography or whether it be uh, kind of educational material, it's almost arbitrary, but 20%, one in five websites are being scrubbed by this ISP called Talk Talk. So this is very prevalent and it's something that we should take notice of and, and kind of start realizing that there is a sort of attack on the, on the freedom of the Oh, internet. there there absolutely is. Um, yeah, the, whether it just be the outright banning of social media or, or the registration process or the firewalls. Another major threat happening right now, of course, is the government surveillance and the corporate surveillance and those two forces work in conjunction with each other. Right. I mean, the, the surveillance aspect of it has a sort of chilling effect. When we, when we go online and we 
before where we didn't think that we were being watched or not even being watched, but just the thought of being all of our information, all of our private communications being cataloged, it sends a chilling effect. And we have, we, we change our, our behavior as a result. We, we, we change our habits. And I think that the longer that this goes on, it's going to have a long, okay, perfect example. When we found out about the, the NSA leaks, we saw corporations, we saw governments kind of change the way that that they operate within the realm of the online world and we're going to continue to see these restrictions being being placed on the internet and a lot of them like I said are, are kind of arbitrary restrictions and they're, they're 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 hurting us and they're hurting the people that are putting the restrictions restrictions in the first place anyway yeah no exactly I, I think you hit it on the head when you said that people act differently when they know that a cameras on them we would act differently right now because we're on TV and we act differently online when we know that we're being searched and when we're being exploited all of our private information from from engines like Google Facebook data mining our messages etc Obviously, this dovetails into the, the threat on net neutrality and the corporatization, commercial, commercialization of the internet. Um, talk about that. Right. I mean, I think that this is probably the the the, mo the biggest threat is the continued corporatization of, of the internet because uh, it goes back to the net neutrality debate. It goes back to the argument of whether or not information should be free and copyrights, patents, these are all things that, that are being fought for online. Aggressive lawsuits are being fought online over, over, over patents and copyright and, and whether or not data and storage and communications are products that... And then you that, see this, this consolidation from the, the already the six giant corporate conglomerates that are now consolidating with make, forcing um, you know, Netflix into pain, Google taking right. over YouTube and all of these different consolidations and it, enc it encourages the, the sort of online surveillance, corporate surveillance, where, where your online profile, your digital habits, your, 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 your behavior online is, is cataloged and then sold to the highest bidder, right? And so right, that, and it internet, kind of feeds a vicious cycle. As someone, uh, you and I have grown up in a generation where we've seen the internet take off and it's changed who we are and it really gave us a chance to flourish as individuals and I just feel like with privacy gone and now this kind of takeover, I don't know what the future of the internet's going to be, Manny. Um, thank you so much for coming on, breaking it down. Manuel Rapolo, BTS producer. <laughs> Cheers. Coming up, I'll talk about why there's over 45,000 SWAT team raids every year in the U.S. Stay tuned. Are you like me? Do you want your comedy news with some teeth? Do you want your comedy news to be a bare-fisted, no-holds-barred fight to the death? Like a truth vampire biting into the necks of the corporate elite and the billionaire freaks while they're going, ah, ah, make it stop! Well, that's what you get with my new show. Redacted tonight. Is that too much? I, 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 think, I think that was too much. What are your thoughts on what's been going on in Washington? Well, it's a mess, Larry. I mean, the whole country is being scoffed at and laughed at. Enough is enough. F the media, f the candidates, f the corporatocracy covering issues that actually affect you and me it doesn't do too much for ad revenue. Biotech agriculture giant takes on a 76-year-old American farmer based in Indiana. How much fallout do you think this is going to create for the CIA? Do you think this is what's triggering the crisis? America's the largest economy in the world. It's also the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Breaking the set is mostly about alternatives to the status quo, but one that gave real alternatives a voice. One minute they were working toward the American dream, the next they were just trying to survive the night. It's time for Americans and lawmakers in Washington to wake up and start talking about the real causes of poverty in America. Imagine the following scenario. You're happily sound asleep in your bed, dreaming of sugar plums and fairies. Your significant other sleeping soundly, curled up next to you. Your children deep asleep under blankets and your dog in a resting pile of fur at the foot of the bed. Suddenly there's a deafening explosion, followed by thunderous noise that startles your entire family. More explosions, smoke, completely traumatized. You leap up to find your entire family being stared down by about 20 paramilitary troops pointing the barrels of semi-automatic rifles and M16s squarely in the faces of those you hold most dear. Then your home is violently ransacked as you and your loved ones sit there shaking uncontrollably. If you object in any way to what's happening, you're tear gassed, handcuffed, and beaten. No, I didn't just describe a night raid in Iraq. I'm talking about the SWAT team raids that happen on average 146 times every single day in homes across the U.S. 
according to a recently released ACLU report, that equates to a whopping 45,000 SWAT raids every year. Now, just for context, back in the mid-1980s, militarized police units were only deployed about 3,000 times a year. So how do we get to this point? Well, in the 1960s, the Los Angeles Police Department formed special weapons and tactics, or SWAT units, in order to better handle situations involving gunmen, hostages, or risks of deadly violence. Now, SWAT units have spread nationwide, further militarizing local police forces. See, in addition to being given excess military equipment like armored tanks and fortified weaponry, police officers are also being trained as if they're just an extension of the military. Right before the Occupy Oakland crackdown, the Oakland Police Department was trained next to the Israeli military and army of the brutal Gulf state of Bahrain. Comforting thought. And these methods have had devastating results, specifically when it comes to terrorizing the communities these officers are allegedly there to protect. Because when a department has the equipment and the manpower, chances are it will use them, even in the most unnecessary of situations. The ACLU's in-depth investigation looked at 800 deployments of SWAT teams across 20 different local, state, and federal police agencies over the course of 2011 to 2012. Among its findings, 62% of the raids were conducted to search for drugs. 80% happened in order to serve a search warrant. Let me repeat that. An insane 8 in 10 SWAT raids were done only to investigate someone who was suspected of committing a crime. There were no hostages or active shooters. In fact, only 7% of cases actually involved anything that could be categorized as such. 36% of the raids resulted in zero contraband being found. But according to the ACLU, incomplete police reports could point that figure to as high as 65%. And of course, all of this disproportionately affects minorities and poor communities. Lastly, over half of SWAT raids includes a violent, forced entry by way of battering rams and explosive devices like flashbang grenades. Now, these grenades are no joke, as the mother of baby Bobo will tell you. In an editorial for Salon, Alicia Phone Savon writes about how a SWAT team raided her home in search for drugs that they thought her husband's nephew had. There were none, but that was only found out after officers broke down her front door and threw a flashbang grenade in her baby son's crib, blowing a hole in his chest. Miraculously, he survived, but remains in the hospital with the probability of severe brain damage. She writes, the only silver lining I can possibly see is that my baby Bobo's story might make us angry enough that we stop accepting brutal SWAT raids as a normal way to fight the war on drugs. Now, ironically, SWAT tactics that were initially created to keep the peace are now the ones actually creating violence where there were none before. But unfortunately, this report only represents a sliver of the militarization problem, considering that almost half of the police agencies ACLU filed public record requests with denied them. According to the ACLU, data collecting and reporting in the context of SWAT was at best sporadic and at worst virtually non-existent. So one can assume that the problem is perhaps even more dire than this report makes crystal clear. But law enforcement's reluctance to provide the public information starts to make more sense when you realize that some SWAT units actually believe they're private corporations, immune from open records laws. So what do we do? Well, go to ACLU's website to contact your local reps and local law enforcement to voice your opposition to this encroaching police state. We need to demand no more tanks, MRAPs, M16s, and paramilitary troops terrorizing families over nonviolent crum crimes like drug use. Because once you blend the insanity of the war on terror with the war on drugs, it becomes a war on everything. The last week has seen tensions between Israeli and Palestinian forces reach a breaking point. After three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped and murdered in the West Bank last month, a Palestinian teen was burned alive in an alleged revenge killing. Since then, Israel has called up 40,000 reserve, I'm sorry, reserve forces, and today the Israeli military bombed at least 50 sites across Gaza, killing at least 16 people as of this broadcast and injuring more than 100 in what's being called Operation Protective Edge. According to government officials, the strikes are in response to armed fractions in Gaza firing rockets into southern Israel, although no deaths have yet been reported as a result of these attacks. 
So you get a better picture of what's happening on the ground as well as the larger implications of the current violence. I was joined earlier from Jerusalem by Miko Piled, the son of a former IDF general, grandson of one of Israel's founding fathers and author of the book, The General's Son. I started by asking Miko to give us an update on the last few days. Ever since this, uh, this case of these three young men that were, uh, that were kidnapped uh, came out, the Israeli army has been, has been marching up and down the West Bank like Roman legions, destroying absolutely everything up on their path, destroying homes, uh, arresting people, beating people, killing people. Um, the situation outside of the West Bank and the rest of the country in Palestinian communities is very frightening. Palestinians are afraid to walk in the streets, they're afraid to go to work, they're afraid to go to the stores. And I'm talking about Palestinians inside Israel, Israeli, Israeli citizens, because there's this insane atmosphere of hatred and, uh, that is being fomented from the top, of course. Um, and they're using, as they always do, this as, as an excuse to, uh, to attack more. And in terms of their own thinking, they're gaining political points, thinking of what it's going to be, how it's going to uh, show next time they, they go to the polls. And I wanted to read two tweets from Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu from about a week ago, who partially quoted a poem uh, by an Israeli poet in the aftermath of the death of the three Israeli teens. Uh, vengeance for the blood of a small child, Satan has not yet created. Neither is vengeance for the blood of three pure youths who are on their way home to the parents who will not see them anymore. Hamas is responsible. Hamas will pay. Uh, Miko, do you think this sort of inflammatory rhetoric on behalf of government officials are fueling the attacks against Palestinians we're seeing now? Oh, absolutely. First of all, it's cynical of Netanyahu to use that because he is responsible for the death and of so many children. You know, every, it's interesting. Everybody's shocked by this particular death of this boy who was kidnapped and burned um, by, you know, the, the, the people who did this. You know, I don't know. What do they think happens when Israel drops bombs from the air on, on civilians? They burn children and kill them all the time. Uh, but it's interesting that suddenly the press and the world has taken an interest in this in this particular thing as though it's unique and, and Netanyahu thought to apologize for this and, 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 and so forth. He is responsible. He and his generals are responsible for so many dead children and, and burnt civilians and so much destruction. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's cynical, it's sad, it's, it's tragic. Um, and I think it's important to realize that Israel is giving the Palestinians only two options, to surrender completely or to resist. And obviously resistance is, is, um, is, is what they're doing right now. Uh, Miko, it is very tragic. It's horrifying. It is amazing how the Western media is finally paying attention when it's an American teen who was beaten. But even then, you see all the framing is alleged beating, apparent beating. Um, even though we have video of the beating, I don't know why it's alleged or apparent. Miko, and let's move on to the IDF Facebook page calling for genocide on a lot of comments. I wanted to read a tweeted out screenshot by journalist Rania Kalik, um, basically invoking genocide of Native Americans as a model. Someone named Stefan Miller says, no more peace, no more releasing terrorists, no more taking prisoners. Kill them all, liked more than 100 times by other people. Do you think this sort of commentary is an aberration or indicative of a larger sentiment? And how do you think the media would be treating these kinds of threads if they were Palestinians writing about Israelis. You know, yesterday I went to, uh, to see the parents and visit the grave of uh, Nadim Nuwara, who was killed just, just before I, I, I was on your show last time. On the 15th of May, he was one of the two youths who was killed. And then afterwards, we went to the family's home, and there were people there talking. And the discussion was very, you know, very casual, very natural, but all about seeking justice and finding the soldiers and taking him to court. And the fact that this this particular case, the murder of, of, of that particular child, and, uh, does not mean that all Israelis are bad, does not mean that all Jews are bad, does not mean that they hate all Israelis or all Jews. This was the sentiment, and this is the discussion in every bereaved home that I visit of Palestinians. Um, and here in Israel, I think it has to do with the basic ideology that framed Israel, the basic ideology upon Israel, which, upon which Israel was established, which is a racist, colonialist, um, ideology, which is what Zionism is, and it calls for the replacement of the native population with Jews. And so we have to remember that the state of Israel was established after a horrendous act of terrorism in which more than half of the population of Palestine was forced out and half of the cities and towns were destroyed. 
So this is, this was the very beginning of the state of Israel, and what is happening today is just a continuation of that. There's really not much difference. Um, and periodically we see these outbursts of, 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 um, of racism and violence peak a little bit more than, than, uh, than, than other times. Right, it seems like it's framed as, as this is a cycle of violence without getting to the root of how, uh, why this is happening. Um, Miko, let's move on to your own experiences on the ground. Last Friday you were protesting in the town of O. Berlin. You were arrested. Uh, why were you there and what circumstances uh, surrounded your arrest? Berlin has become the mecca of the nonviolent resistance. The, the popular resistance in Palestine came out of Berlin. It's a small town. Uh, maybe half an hour drive from Jerusalem, a small village actually, it's not a town, it's a village. And the people began this uh, nonviolent popular resistance and they're met with, with horrendous violence by the Israeli military, arrests, beatings and so forth. Uh, the, the protests take place every Friday and whenever I'm here I join them, they're good friends of mine and I support them completely. Um, and so um, we walk all the way up to where they built the wall, on, this, on the lands of what used to be the lands of Bilin, there's now a city, a city uh, that was built for Jews only. It's called Modin Elite. And so they walk up to the to the wall which was built uh, right there on their land and protest. And so the Israeli army stands up at the top of the wall and shoots um, tear gas and, and shot grenades at the crowd. And then at one point they open this big gate in the, in the wall and they come in with their armored vehicles and their soldiers dressed with riot gear and full combat in full combat gear i don't know why because there is no riots going on and there's no combat there it's just civilians with a few flags and you know some students who come and and, and the local palestinians and um when they began shooting they've got these little grenade launchers not little big grenade launchers on the vehicles and they start shooting them into the crowd the crowd begins to run away, of course, and they keep shooting. And I stood there by the officer in charge, and uh, I didn't move away. I stood there, and I, and I talked to him, and I tried to talk to him, and I to tell him that this was illegal and that he's shooting into, a, an, un, into an unarmed crowd. And one day he's going to have to explain this in court. At which time he turned to me, started pushing me, and, uh, and proceeded to arrest me. And then I spent the next 10 hours with, with these uh, soldiers and, and, and police and being interrogated and questioned and so forth. How would you recommend, as someone who was, uh, you know, your family was intimately involved in the Foundation of Israel, your father, an IDF general, um, what do you suggest the Israeli government do when Hamas is saying that they will fire more rockets into Israel that they claim have the potential to reach Tel Aviv? If they don't like the rockets, they can lift the siege on Gaza and allow the Palestinian refugees to go back to their homes. Uh, furthermore, they can release all the Palestinian prisoners unconditionally and call for free and fair elections, uh, one person, one vote for everyone who lives in this country, and cancel the apartheid regime, in other words, topple the apartheid regime. This is what needs to happen, and it needs to happen immediately, and until it happens, the world needs to boycott this place Thank and, you. and impose sanctions on Israel. Thank you so much, Miko Piled. Appreciate it. Join me tomorrow when I break the set all over again. Doctors to get a fuller picture of their patients, thereby decreasing readmittance rates. But conspicuously, the company won't disclose the provider of the data. Now, thankfully, the Affordable Care Act outlaws the use of personal data to lower or raise insurance rates, but that isn't stopping other health care providers from using big data to bolster their bottom lines. Take the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, for example. The health care providers' information division, I'm sorry, insurance division, is using demographic data to zero in on those who make less than $50,000 a year because poorer people tend to go to the emergency room more. Listen, I'm all for preventative health care, but invading every aspect of people's private lives sure as hell ain't the way to go about it. As Assistant Director of Healthcare Ethics at Santa Clara University puts it, if the physician already has the information, the relationship changes from an exchange of information to a potential inquisition. The five-year rule has helped historians clarify moments in American history ranging from the Vietnam War to the Cuban Missile Crisis. But even with over a billion pages released by the government to date, many of these historic records are still shrouded from public view. Now, theoretically, any American citizen can file a FOIA request to access this information, including government officials, which is exactly what one former CIA agent did. His name's Jeffrey Scudder, former CIA officer with the agency's Historical Collections Division. And his job was to convert documents into searchable digital files. 
back in 2007, he stumbled upon thousands of articles that were listed as public but were not actually searchable within the National Archives that related to World War II and Cold War era intelligence and espionage. Now, doing only his job, Scudder attempted to have the documents released by the CIA, only to be blocked by the Oversight Review Board. So he did what any American has the legal right to do. He filed a full... What's happening, guys? I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. So it's pretty clear at this point that the age of the privacy has gone the way of the dodo bird. But at least there's one area where people still feel secure, with their doctors. Well, now you can kiss that notion goodbye as well. See, a new report from Bloomberg Business Week outlines a questionable new practice being employed by Carolina's healthcare system, a healthcare provider that operates over 900 medical centers across North and South Carolina. Turns out the hospital chain is actually mining the credit card information of 2 million patients in order to predict when they will get sick. And get this, the provider is even using patient purchase information to have doctors preemptively intervene in their lives. Now, Carolina's Healthcare is defending the practice by saying this type of data collection allows doctors about behavior. Indeed. With a for-profit healthcare system firmly in place, the last thing we need are insurance predators itching to exploit one of the last bastions of privacy we have. Now let's break the set. It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make it up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, wait, do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. What we need is to question more and to keep it My is to change the globe. I'm a set. Under the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, it's the right of every U.S. citizen to file requests. And every year, the U.S. government receives thousands of inquiries for the declassification of documents. Now, even though Obama declared that his administration would be the most transparent in history, according to a study by the Associated Press, the administration's denial of requests has actually gotten worse over Obama's presidency. In fact, last year saw a 22% increase in national security exemptions from the previous year. Now, many of these requests are for relatively recent documents. But what about documents dating back decades? Under the statute of limitations for declassification, every year millions of documents are automatically released to the public when they reach 25 years old, unless an agency seeks an exemption for secrecy. The 